Um, anyways, I want to share from uh, John chapter 3 on, uh, on being born again and some things that uh, come out of that, uh, that passage. I'm going to read the five or six verses and then I'm going to go back and talk about them. So John chapter 3 verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So there's two sort of key things that were speaking to my heart as I read through this passage. And it's verse 3 and verse 5. So in verse 3, in response to Nicodemus uh, saying that he must be a teacher and said from God, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I don't exactly know why that was Jesus' response to Nicodemus, per se, but I've pondered as to maybe it was a response to Nicodemus, because Nicodemus was coming to Jesus, acknowledging him as a teacher, but I'm wondering if Jesus was trying to tell Nicodemus, listen, you're acknowledging me as a teacher, but you're completely missing here. You're completely missing the point that I'm sharing with you. Nicodemus, you're not seeing the kingdom of God. You're not seeing it because you're not born again. But a privilege and a, and a, and a, and a promise to those who are born again is that they can see the kingdom of God. And I was reflecting on my own heart and my own experience and sort of saying, like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to go from a place where you can't see the kingdom of God? Because those who are not born again cannot see the kingdom of God. But those who are born again can see the kingdom of God. And I think it's important because it's one of the, one of the key principles that Jesus says about being born again. Like, it's evidence of being born again, that you can see the kingdom of God. And what's more, I would say it's one of the intentions, it's one of God's purposes in making a path of salvation, making a way for us to be made new, is that we would see the kingdom of God. That we would become from a place where we don't have our eyes on the earth, and all that's going around on around us, and all that's of this earth, and all that's of our natural state. We're born of flesh. We're born of flesh. We're born of the first Adam. And we live our lives up until the point where we're born again, completely fixated on this kingdom. We cannot see past it. There's like a veil there where all we can see is the kingdom around us. And all we can see is the things of earth and the things of the natural man and our needs and our selfish wants and everything the flesh desires. The flesh, the eyes of the flesh are very hungry, always looking around at what it could get and what it wants and what it lusts after. But once we're born again, the promise is that we can see the kingdom. We can see the kingdom of God. And that starts now. That starts now. Like I was reflecting on Jesus Christ and how he lived his life on this earth. And every single day he lived his life with his eyes wide open to the kingdom of God. He lived, he woke up in the morning and he saw his father, and he went through his day doing whatever he did, whether it be uh, before he was put into ministry, working in the carpenter shop, 
working in his home, whatever it was, however he spent his days, whether it be the mundane tasks of work or whether it be once he had been sort of uh, uh, appointed by God to go into public ministry, in both cases, he lived his days with his eyes wide open to the kingdom of God. He was seeing the kingdom of God when he worked in the carpentry shop. And he was also seeing the kingdom of God when he healed ten lepers on the road and, uh, and, and, and was performing miracles and, and uh, seeing, seeing dramatic signs and wonders. In both of these cases, he was seeing the kingdom of God. And that was his focus. And I was reflecting on that for myself, saying, you know what? If I've been born again, where's my focus? Am I seeing the kingdom of God? Do I spend my days with my eyes open to the kingdom of God? And it was a good challenge to me. We've been given this privilege. Those who are born again have been given this privilege that we can see the kingdom of God. And I was just challenged. I was like, am I living that way? Am I living that way as one who's been born again? Do I, do I have this as a burden in my heart that I go through my days seeing God's kingdom, seeing in the challenges that come? What does it mean to see the kingdom of God? Well, I can share a few things, and they're just sort of from practical experience. But from seeing the kingdom of God is the opportunity, when trials and tests come, to see that God is working here. To see that God wants to produce something of the nature of Jesus Christ inside of That is an opportunity to see the kingdom of God. What's another opportunity to see the kingdom of God? Another opportunity to see the kingdom of God is when we go through our days, and I forget, somebody was, Andrew was sharing about our will and our desire to do our own will. Well, the kingdom of God is focused on quite the contrary. The kingdom of God actually says, go into the ground and die, that you might, might bear much fruit. And let, let your days be conformed to the will of our Heavenly Father, who has a much better plan to us, for us and, and, a, and a path for us to walk that will actually be fulfilling a perfect perfect path for us and it's it's in dying to our own will and seeing those opportunities where something come and a decision comes and we'll have the opportunity to actually be not so fixated because I say these things as a challenge myself I know and I've experienced I can rush through my days so focused on what I want to do and what I want to get done and the things I need to my little list and agenda that I can miss the opportunities to see the kingdom of God where God says no stop I have something different for you right now you need to lay aside your plan and your will here and get your eyes open to what I want you to be doing and see an opportunity to bless others. See an opportunity to walk through a situation with your heart in tune to my will and see how it goes. See how that changes the day. And I can just, I know I'm speaking in generalities here, but I'm speaking of things that I've experienced because I know in times I've gone through days so focused on my own will and ultimately, what does it produce? It just produces just strength and division and, and things in the home that are just selfishness and ultimately discord. Whereas I know other times that I've gone through the day and had my ears and eyes open a little bit more to God's will and had the opportunity to say, when the test comes, you know what? Okay, Heavenly Father, I think you're trying to steer me here. You're trying to show me a path here that's better than what I had intended. And when I yield my will to that, all of a sudden there's fruit. All of a sudden there's fruit. All of a sudden the kingdom of God is taking a little more root in my home. Because I'm able to lead my children with an example that was guided by my Heavenly Father. There's an opportunity to see the kingdom of God take root in my home because there's peace between my wife and I. Because I'm denying my own will and letting the Holy Spirit work in my heart so that there can actually be a, a yielding and a pursuing a peace with my wife. And where peace, God's peace and God's kingdom can be working my home. And why do I say this? Well, just one example of the kingdom of God. Let's just quickly turn to Romans. Just because I think it's a good anchor for us when we talk about these things. I think it's Romans chapter 14. I actually didn't write this verse down. Am I right on that? Maybe I think some of you guys know the verse I'm trying to think of. There it is. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. It says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Now why does he say eating and drinking here? He 
saying eating and drinking because there's some strife and contention going on here about what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat. And it's actually producing, it's producing brothers and sisters who are actually coming into division with one another because neither of them has the has the vision. They're not seeing the kingdom of God. All they're seeing is some rule that they think makes them righteous. And they're missing and completely missing the kingdom of God. So there actually is a division coming and they're looking down on one another and thinking, oh, this brother doesn't have faith, so he's he's only eating all the vegetables. They look down on him and the, those who are eating only the vegetables look down on the other brother who's eating some meat and, and saying, well, that brother just does it because of a hard conscience because he's doing these things. And Paul's saying, listen, guys, it's not about that at all. If you read the whole first part of the chapter, he talks about not judging and accepting one another. And then he concludes kind of by saying, listen, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if you want to know what it means to see the kingdom of God, to have a vision of this, one aspect of seeing the kingdom of God is seeing the path of peace and joy and righteousness in our lives. Seeing the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us into these areas. And that's why I said when there's opportunity in our homes for division to come, for strife to come, and we see the Holy Spirit show us and guide us into the path of peace where we can pursue peace with our spouse, all of a sudden, that's seeing the kingdom of God. That is seeing the kingdom of God. When we see an opportunity to find joy in the midst of a trial, and joy in the midst of yielding our will, or joy in the midst of something that we didn't necessarily, uh, wouldn't have chosen, now you're getting your eyes open to the kingdom of God. Now we're starting to see the kingdom of God. And this is the opportunity given to us who have been born again, that we can walk and live our lives in a way that we actually have our eyes open to this. That rather, instead of seeing a situation come, where it's not exactly as we would have wished it and actually resenting it or fighting against it or pushing against it, that's, that's the old way. That's the way of the flesh. We're blind there. We're looking at things as the earth there. Whereas if we actually allow the Holy Spirit and allow our hearts to be soft, we can actually go into that same situation and see the kingdom of God. We can say, listen, oh, there's a path here that I hadn't seen and it's a dying inside of me to take it, but there's a path here that leads to righteousness, peace, and joy. And all of a sudden, our eyes are getting a little more open to the kingdom of God. Um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. So I was reflecting on seeing the kingdom of God, having my eyes open to it. There's a couple of passages here in Hebrews chapter 11 about those who were actually living under the old covenant. They didn't even have the opportunity to be born again, as Jesus promised. But yet they still are a testimony to us in where their gaze was fixed and how they lived their lives. Because I think in my own heart, as I was reflecting on this, this, this thought of seeing the kingdom of God, I was thinking there's a couple of ways that I've kind of expressed one a few different times now about just yielding our will and dying to ourselves and, and, and opportunity to see the kingdom of God that way. But I think one of the other ways we can be blinded from the kingdom of God is just because we're so focused on this, this life. Like it's the, the thorns and the, the thorns and the thistles, the pursuit of wealth, and the pursuit of all of our ambitions and our plans and all these things can actually choke out the seed, which I would say chokes us out from being able to see the kingdom of God. And I was reading a couple of different passages which I'll read now about, about some of the forefathers in the faith and how they lived their lives. I have to say, man, it was convicting. It was convicting. So starting in Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as, a, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham's life 
is a life of being given promises by God. Of being given promises by God, but having to wait to see them fulfilled. The one he saw fulfilled in his life was the birth of Isaac. That one he actually saw. But even in that case, he was given a promise by God, and he had to wait. He had to wait. And what was God teaching us? God was teaching us and teaching Abraham to get his eyes off of what's right in front of him. Get his eyes off of just the the day-to-day -day reality of what we can see in our, in our natural minds and in our natural states and have our minds fixed on what God has promised and what God has said he'll do. Because Abraham, A, he had the promise of a son and, an inher and, and children, which he had to wait for and ultimately God. But Abraham also was given the promise of the land, the land of Israel. Like There was a promise given to him there. And his life, he never actually saw it. He died in faith. He died in faith. They were living in tents. They didn't have established cities. The, the Hittites and the Jebusites, all these, other, all these other nations were still there when Abraham died. But he believed the promise. And it said he lived his life looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He lived his life not looking at the natural things, not looking at how am I going to get this land? God has promised me this land. How am I going to get this? How am I going to make this happen? Or any of these things. He just lived his life accepting God's will, accepting the path God gave him on because he wasn't even looking, wasn't even looking for something he could do. He wasn't looking for a city he could build. And it's like us. We don't, we don't want to live our lives trying to figure out how we're going to do it. How we're going to build a family, how we're going to build even a church, how are we going to do it? Abraham was interested in what God was going to do. And that's what he wanted to see. He wanted to see what God was going to do. And that's what he lived his life. And how did, how, did, how, did, how did the rubber hit the road? How did it actually work itself out? Well, I'm sure there's many examples, but the one that came to mind for me was, was when him and Lot split. I think most of us are familiar with this story. The, the herdsmen, they're getting too much cattle, and, and, and it's hard to coexist with his nephew Lot because there's, there's uh, too many cattle and too many herdsmen. And the herdsmen are starting to fight over the water that's available and stuff, and they decide to split up. They decide it's best to split up. And what does Abraham do? Abraham goes to Lot and said, this is not good. We should not have this strife between us. Listen, Lot, you choose. There's lots of land here. You choose where we should go. And whatever you choose, I'll go the other direction. And what does Lot choose? Lot chooses the land by Sodom and Gomorrah because it looked so good. To his natural mind, it's green. There's cities there. He can trade. It's easier to make some money and all these different things that I'm presuming are going through his mind. He chooses the land around Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, yeah, that's fine. I'll go the other way. And what does God do? God takes Abraham up on a mountain and says, look, 360, I'm going to give you this. Now, why is that? Because Abraham wasn't seeking to build, like, the natural man would say, listen, God gave me, I got promises from God of land here. Lot, you don't have those promises, so you go over there, I'm going to take this, because I already know God's promised me this, and I'm going to start making some stuff happen here. Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham just yields his will and says, Lot, you choose. You choose what you want, and I'll take the other. And in that, in that, God blesses him. In that, God says, yeah, I'm pleased with that, Abraham. I'm pleased that you're not trying to build something here for yourself. That all you want, all you're interested in, is what I can give you. Not what you can take from Lot, and arm wrestle, and pull out of him. You're only interested in what I'm going to give you, and because of that, I'm going to give you a promise that all of this land you see will be yours. And if we go to verse 13, we talked about some of the preceding people, which are Abraham and Sarah and Noah and others. In verse 13 it says, All of these die in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, 
they would have an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared the city for them. And I just read that. I was like, man. The lives they lived confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Verse 13. I just had to ask, like, is my life, does my life confess that I am a stranger and an exile here? That I'm just passing through, that I've been given a vapor that is the amount of time that I've been given to live. God has a perfect plan for that period. But I'm going to miss that plan if my focus is trying to establish something here. If my focus is trying to build something for myself, get what I can, and live a life that fulfills my selfishness and maybe has God on the side, we're going to miss out. God's calling for us is that we live a life where our lives confess that we are strangers and exiles on earth because we're not seeking that which we can build ourselves. We're not seeking that which we can build ourselves, but we're desiring a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The calling of those who are born again is to have our eyes and our minds and our attention on the city that God has built, on the country that God has made, the place that he's prepared for us, not to be seeking a country here. Not to be having, as it says it, it says in verse 15, that if we, if we had our eyes fixed on what everyone else in the world has their eyes fixed on, and I don't say that derogatorily, it's just those who have been blessed to be born again should have our eyes set differently. Everyone else in this world who has not been born again has only one thing that they can see, and that is just the here, the now. Now what we can get for ourselves now, and seeing a city and uh, establishing something here and now. And if we let our gaze fix there as well, we will have opportunity to go back. Being able to see the, I guess one of the, being able to see the kingdom of God is a privilege that we've been given. But it's not a foregone conclusion. It's not like once you've been born again, you can't see anything but the kingdom of God. That's not the way God made it. It's not the way God made it at all. The way He made it is this. That when we're born again, we get a glimpse. We start to see it. We start to see God's kingdom. We start to see His path and His pattern. And His desire is that vision of God's kingdom would go brighter and brighter until the full day. That our lives would be spent with just an expanding vision of God's kingdom and how He's working and all the wonderful ways he's blessing us, and all the ways that his kingdom is working in our lives, and the lives of our families, and the lives of our church, and the lives of those we have, that he brings into our lives. That's his desire. But it is, the alternative is there. You can get that glimpse. You can start to see the kingdom, but rather just fix our eyes back on this earth, and on the, on the natural, and the here and now, and we can just end up living there completely missing completely having just like a, maybe a glimpse here and there of the kingdom of God, but not having to be our focus. I don't speak this to speak down on anybody, because I say these things challenging myself, but I read these things myself, so I'm like, man, where's my focus? What am I doing? And I think it's good to be challenged by these things. Let's turn back to John chapter 3. So the first thing, born again, and there's a promise to those who are born again of seeing the kingdom of God. And then Jesus also says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I think it's good to understand or get some core, other, other light from Scripture about what it means to be born of water and the Spirit. And there's a number of passages you can go to, but the one that I liked this morning was uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25, it starts. It says, 
Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone and from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So what we're seeing here in the prophecy that Ezekiel had was that there would be a washing. The water comes to wash us. The water comes to bring us to a place where we can actually come into fellowship with our Heavenly Father because our sins have been forgiven. Everyone has to have, anyone who's going to enter the kingdom of God has to be washed. Because if there's still any of that stench of our sins on us, there's no entry into the kingdom of God. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be washed, we can be cleansed, and we can be completely and utterly clean from our sins. That's one aspect of being born again. Another aspect of being born again is in verse 26, where we get a new heart. And I love that song we sang this morning about having that heart transplant, where the heart of stone is removed, and we're given a heart of flesh, a soft heart. And then the third part, I'm going to come back to the part of soft heart, and then, and then that the spirit would be put within us to cause us to walk in the statutes and the ordinances of God. But as I was reflecting on these things, and I'll be honest, it was helped by a message I listened to recently. One of the great promises of being born again is that we can get a soft heart. All of us are naturally born with a spiritually hardened heart. A heart that is completely dead to the, to the kingdom of God. Completely dead to God's plan and God speaking to us. And when we're born again, we are given the privilege of actually being given a softened heart. We're actually being given the privilege of being given a softened heart. And I can tell you this thing is just, it's a wonderful thing to meditate on. Because I can even think about it in the form of young people. Like, even really quite young. This soft heart is such a miracle that when even a child comes to God and there's a transformation that happens, you can see this. This, this soft heart is a gift from heaven where all of a sudden they're sensitive. There's a sensitivity to God. There's a sensitivity to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. And as we as adults, this is a promise that we've been given that if we're born again, we can actually have a sensitive heart. And this, to me, ties directly with being able to see the kingdom. Because it's this sensitive heart that can actually hear God, that can actually see God directing us, see God helping us and guiding us, because it's actually able to, to, to see, listen, the path you're going down right now is just bringing division, it's just bringing tension, it's bringing strife, it's not, it's not bringing peace. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If our hearts become hardened, we get totally deadened. Where you can't even tell that the peace is gone. Where you can't even tell that the joy is absent. Where you're just trying to fill it back up with joy from this world and things from this world. We can't even tell that God's righteousness is, is slipping away because our hearts are getting hardened. We're not sensitive to it. But the promise is that those who are born again have a sensitive heart that the Holy Spirit can speak to, that the Holy Spirit can guide and, and, and give us wisdom and give us direction. And it's just, to me, a wonderful promise that we've been given and that we can experience. And I hope that all of us are experiencing it. And if our hearts do feel hard, then let's cry out and say, God, soften my heart again. Give me a heart that can be sensitive to your leading, can be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that I can have a better vision, that I can start to see more of the kingdom of God, that I can start to experience really more of the kingdom of God in my life, because my heart is becoming soft once again. So just a few more verses on this topic. 
Turn to Matthew chapter uh, 5. If we reflect on being born again and, and having a soft heart, some of the passages that uh, apply to this are found in Hebrews, right? I think probably for many of us they'll come to mind, right? Like, what does the author of Hebrews continue to warn the Hebrew church about? Harden not your hearts. Do not let your hearts get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It's like a burden, a burden to the author of that letter. That a church, the Hebrews were a church where the gospel was first preached, where it had started, and then disseminated out throughout the world. So they should be furthest along. But the burden of the author, the burden of the Holy Spirit is, listen, don't let your hearts be hardened. It's a, it's a, and I, I take that because I think it's good for us to be reminded of that as we go through our walk. The Holy Spirit could be saying the same thing to us. Listen, don't let your heart be hardened. Don't let your heart be hardened through the sequence of sin. Maintain a soft heart so that you can see God's glory, so that you can see the kingdom of God, so that you can see the path, so you can be sensitive to his leading and actually see God's kingdom growing and evident in your life. And just thinking about keeping a soft heart, a few of these verses really jumped out at me today. Matthew 5.28 But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I think the thing that was speaking to me there is, listen, if we're born again, if we've been given a new heart, yeah. we're going to bring this into our heart. We're going to bring this adultery into this new heart that God's given us. Like it's fearful to think of that. Why Jesus was so focused, like the old covenants that had laws about the outside. Jesus says, No, I want your inside to be clean. I want your inside to be preserved. I want the kingdom of God to be working on your inside. What are the other passages? Do not commit a murder. Jesus says, No, don't be angry. If you have anger, unforgiveness, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, yourself can't be forgiven. And I think for me personally, was a lie to you this morning, was tying this into the fact that we've been given this new heart. Those who've been born again have been given this new heart. And we need to be sensitive. We can't let these things come in and harden our hearts. Harden our hearts. For me, it was just a fresh sobriety that says, listen, I've been born again. I've been born again. I've been given the privilege of seeing the kingdom of God. I've been given the privilege that my heart that was hard as a stone and completely and utterly selfish has been given a place where the Holy Spirit, where it's now soft and I can hear the Holy Spirit and I can see God working. Do not let lust. Do not let anger. Do not let these other warnings come in to that heart. Do not let that heart get corrupted by these things. Guard your heart. As it says in Proverbs, guard your heart. For out of it comes the issues of life. Out of it comes our very life. The kingdom is found there. The kingdom is within us. The kingdom of God starts within us. And we need to guard I'll read one more verse, Matthew 6, 21. Daddy. Daddy. Actually, I'll read in verse 20. Daddy. Verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think it's the same as the, the theme is having 
this adultery or anger or other things in our heart, if we let our eyes be fixated on this life and this earth, this heart we've been given, this new heart we've been given, the heart that is the, the soft heart that is transplanted in through being born again, it naturally is drawn to heaven. It naturally is in tune with the Spirit. It wants to work within us. It wants to be listening to the Spirit and, and, and listening to the promises of God and, and guiding us and helping us be sensitive that we can be sensitive to the, to the kingdom of God and what God wants to do in our lives. That's His natural inclination. It wants to help us see, because I can admit it. I can admit it for myself, the need to store up treasure in heaven. I'll be honest, this is one for me that at times I'm just like, what does that mean? Like, where is this? What is this treasure in heaven? Like, what should I be doing today? And storing up treasures in heaven. And I can tell you, at times it's a bit of a mystery to me, and I don't want to miss out on it. But it can just feel so natural to deal with everything that's going on around us in the here and now that we can miss out on the treasures of heaven. But I think the promise I have and the hope I have is that as I allow my heart to be soft, as I allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to me. He's going to help me. He is going to help me to store up treasures in heaven. He is going to show me the opportunities that are there to put away treasure that will never be destroyed. An inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled waiting for me. As it says in 1 Peter, where it also talks about being born again. It talks about being born again in 1 Peter. I'll just, just quickly read it before I finish. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that His divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through a true knowledge... Well, that's 2 Peter. Thank you. Where is the verse 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And I just, for myself, I want more vision of that. I want to have a soft heart. I want to have my eyes open to the kingdom of God so that I have an even greater sense of this inheritance that is reserved in heaven unperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, and reserved there for me. That's where I want my eyes to be open as to how I can be building and adding to that treasure. Or I don't want to be storing up treasures for myself down here. I want to be storing up treasures in heaven where that soft heart that we've been given, it naturally wants us to be to be storing up treasures in heaven. It's our own, it's our old ways. It's our getting ourselves fixated on this life. It's just the the old patterns and paths and everything around us, everything around us screams and cries out to store up treasure here. Store up treasure here. And how does it scream and cry that? Because some people may say, listen, I have no desire to have a mansion. I have no desire to have fancy cars or fancy jewelry. That's only part of it. How it screams and it says, you need this now to be happy. That's storing up treasure here. It says, you need this. You need this that you see around you. You need this thing, this, this relationship, this, uh, this esteem, whatever it is. You need this now in order to be happy. Because then our eyes are fixated on that thing and we're storing up treasure here. Because we think that's our path to happiness. But the kingdom of God says, no, it's not going to make you happy. I want to guide you into what will give you true joy, true peace, and righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else gets taken care of. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. That's why we need to have soft hearts. That's why I want a soft heart, so I can actually be guided by the Holy Spirit into truly seeking first the kingdom of God and not being distracted by everything else that goes on, thinking that my happiness is somehow in obtaining this, that, or the other thing. Each and every day, I feel like there's something that comes into my life and into my mind that says, I need this today to be happy. I need this little thing today to be happy. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, no, you don't. 
Fix your eyes on the kingdom of God. Everything else will get taken care of. I'll show you what you truly need. And he blesses us. We get rich together here. It's not like we have to live a life of living like a monk in a, in a castle somewhere. He blesses us yeah, richly yeah, here. Yeah. But it cannot be our focus. Our focus has to be on the heavenly things because what the enemy wants to do and what everything else wants around us wants to do is pull our gaze down to this earth, to this life, yeah. and focus us on what we think we need to be happy here rather than storing up treasure in heaven and finding the true joy and the true peace that are found in the kingdom of God. So I hope, hope these things make some sense. I, for myself this morning, just as I read them, I can say I was definitely, I was challenged. I can say for myself, this is what I want. I want this. I want this. And each day, there can be battles and tests to pull us away from it, to try and draw us further away from what God wants as opposed to closer. But my heart is all fire. Help me to make the better choices. Help me to choose the path that gives me a soft heart, keeps my heart soft before you so that I can continue to grow and be hearing from you. And I can say, I haven't obtained it yet. I've confessed here in front of you guys. I need to see more of the true riches. I need to have a better vision for the inheritance and story of treasure in heaven. But I can say, reading these scriptures and meditating on these things have definitely spurred me on and encouraged me that this is what I want. I want more of it. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. Hopefully, you can do the same thing.